long note sets. I had an art history class where the professor went for two and a half hours in the dark each week. So we're looking at nuclear fission and nuclear fusion fission. Nuclear fission is the energy from the spitting, splitting, uh, spitting, yeah, the splitting of an atom. Now, if I get going too fast, okay, because I haven't taught this way in a long time, just give me a little hand wave and I'll stop and give you more time, okay? So nuclear fission is the energy from the splitting of atoms. So we all good? All righty, now, Nuclear fission program, the process itself, is a causing of reactions to split. Now what happens here is this neutron strikes a uranium molecule, okay? When the uranium gets hit, it breaks down into barium and krypton. So the two elements we get from the reaction is barium and krypton. But then we also get at least one, two, three, and sometimes four neutrons kicking off. Those neutrons go and hit additional uranium molecules, which cause them to split in the barium, and they split, and then they split, and they split. We call this process a chain reaction. Definition of a chain reaction is where one reaction causes further reactions. One reaction causes further reactions is a chain reaction. Now, we knew this process as of the 1920s. Could do it happen in, in theory, but it wasn't until the late 1930s that we actually were able to see it take place because we had to come up with something called critical mass. Now, critical mass is defined as Need more space there, makes because it's a little smaller. Awesome. The amount of fissionable material needed to sustain a chain reaction. Now, fissionable material usually is one of two elements, either uranium or plutonium. The amount of fissionable material needed to sustain a chain reaction. In the late 1930s, they first got this amount. Does anybody know in which country they first were able to identify and obtain enough fissile material to sustain a chain reaction? Any idea what country? Late 1930s. What country was very big in science and trying to push things and prove themselves as the elite in the late 1930s? Russia. No. Germany. Go ahead. Germany. Yeah, Germany. No. That's awesome, that's great, they have this material. But there is a problem. Who is in charge of Germany in the late 1930s? <laughs> the Nazis, Hitler, right? So, are we good? No, we don't say yay to Hitler, okay? All right, in 1939, this letter was written. You don't have to write the letter down. No, no, just let you know. This is the actual letter that was written. And I don't know if you can see, can you see the name there? It's Einstein. This letter was actually written by a scientist named Leo Ziller, okay? But Einstein's name was put on the letter. Why didn't Ziller, this, this was a letter written to the President of the United States at the time, FDR, from Einstein. Now, why didn't, yes, sir? Commissioner, you said that we have to do this. No, can you get me at the end of the third? Uh, I, I'm teaching right now. Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Can, can, can we do it at the end of the third? Well, I don't know if we'll be, if we'll be able to. We have to record this stuff as well. Okay, what, what I'll do is I'll record and I'll send this guy. I'm teaching right now, so I have class right now. All right, so FDR gets a letter from my side. Now, why didn't Ziller just send the letter himself? I see, you know Leo Ziller? Yeah. No, he's a, he's a physicist, okay? Do you know Albert Einstein? Absolutely. Yeah, Einstein was the rock star of the 1930s. 
He had just come up with a, the theory of relativity. Literally, when Einstein would go out in the street, crowds would swirl around him, women would swoon. It was literally like a rock star. So he had the clout to get FDR's attention. Well, did he get his attention? 1939, they started a project called the Fission Program. Now, the Fission Program was attempting to do what the Germans were doing, and it sort of floated around. It really didn't do a whole lot. It didn't do a whole lot until, make sure I can get down there, hit the date. Until, oh, where's that? There. August 1942, when the Manhattan Project was born. Now, what happened between late 1939 and August of 1942? Yeah, we got into World War II. Why? What happened? What date pushed us into World War II? December 7th, 1941, when we got attacked by Japan at Pearl Harbor. We're now in the war. We know we got to make sure that we stay up with the Germans, the Japanese, and the Italians. So we started the Manhattan Project. All right. Now, the Manhattan Project had four main sites. The first site was Los Alamos. New Mexico. Now, there's two reasons that this site was chosen. Can someone give me either of the two? Well, the, the one reason is isolation. Okay, it was literally a three-day bus ride from any place to get Los Alamos. Why did they pick this totally isolated spot? There's two reasons for it. Any idea? Safety. Yeah, safety. When they were doing the, uh, the mathematical tests for the presence of a nuclear reaction, there was a 10 to 15% chance of complete atmospheric inversion. What does that mean? There was a fear that if we set the bomb off, the atmosphere would inverse, our atmosphere would cease to exist, and all life on the planet was dead. Is that a concern? Yeah. yeah. No, it's about 10 to 15%. So they figured it's relatively safe. So they went for it. Okay. But these are things they didn't know. Second reason. Does anybody know the second reason we chose Los Alamos, New Mexico? A three day bus ride from anywhere. Secrecy. Yes. They did not want anyone to know what was going on there. Officially, the people in the Manhattan Project didn't work there. No one worked for Los Alamos, New Mexico. Yes, sir. It, it was a theoretical possibility. It didn't happen. What, what, what they were fearing was enough energy. It would literally split the atmosphere. The atmosphere collapsed in on itself. And it's, it's like, you remember, we're, oh, I'll talk about this later. Um, something called nuclear... Um, China syndrome, a chance for the entire Earth to implode. In theory, it's possible. 10 to 15% chance. And when they, when they set the bomb off, they went, oh, wow, I guess 985%. We're good. Plan still around. All right. Now, the second site was Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Now, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the reason why it was chosen is because there is a dam there. Okay. It was part of the TVA, part of Roosevelt's um, New Deal, and it was part of the Tennessee Valley Authority, TV, ten, uh, the process. Now, what they did there inside of the, the dam is they had cyclotrons. Oh, the right one's listen. Okay, what cyclotrons are is they're basically spinning operations, okay? And they form uranium-235. Now, if you look at your periodic chart, uranium's primary form is uranium-238, all right? And 238 will work, but it's not as energetic and reactive as the, what's the matter, man? I can't believe Cyclotron. That, that's the device they had inside of it. You see, they needed to have a lot of energy. 
And so having it inside of the dam allowed it to be kept secret so no one was there. All right, so they, they got fissionable uranium-235 from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The third site was Richland, Washington. Now in Richland, Washington, they used super magnets to produce polonium. Okay, I'm sorry, plutonium. Plutonium is a man-made substance. You look at the periodic chart, it's not filled in. It's a man-made substance, okay? And what they would do is they would slam elements together to form it. Now, the first time they tried it, <coughs> these magnets were so strong, they literally pulled the metal fibers out of the wall and they collapsed the building down, okay? So they had to reinforce with other structures like concrete to make sure they didn't have that problem again. But they formed plutonium in Richland, Washington. And the last site was Manhattan, New York. Why do you think they chose Manhattan, New York? What's the name of the project? Manhattan Project, right. And basically what's going on here, okay? They just kept track of the books. But it was also used as a means of deception. Did the Nazis know about the Manhattan Project? Absolutely. They had their spot. So here's the Manhattan Project. Where do they think to go? Manhattan. In fact, in, in New York Harbor, in the Hudson River, they found U-boats trying to get in to find the Manhattan Project. So they used it as a form of deception to keep them away from the actual location of Los Alamos, New Mexico. So, once they came up with this project, three different devices were theorized. The first was called the little boy. Okay, now you can try to do this drawing if you want to. You only need three main parts. Okay, you need this, you need this, and you need this. Okay, right here we have a conventional explosive, TNT. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna explode a substance. When we, where do we explode it? Do we want it when it hits the ground or we want it in the air? You want it in the air. Okay. So above here is an altimeter. Okay, so the altimeter is going, if you guys ever seen the movie Pearl Harbor, I know it's getting a little bit older now. In Pearl Harbor, they have that spinning thing. That's the altimeter. When it gets to that exact height, it goes off, okay? Did I tell you about my skydiving experience? No. I went skydiving once. I had a nice old altimeter here. And when I went, I paid 120 bucks. I watched a one hour video and I jumped out of an airplane. And that was my entire training. I had a friend of mine who was an army ranger. I told him about it. He told me that's the stupidest thing he ever heard in his life. When I went, they said, Oh, by the way, do you see those power lines out there? If you get blown into those, make sure you grab one line and not two. Because you grab two lines, you're going to fry to death. And oh, by the way, this is northeast. If you blow into the vineyards, make sure you go with the vineyards and not across them. Because at 15 miles an hour, they'll cut you to shreds. And oh, by the way, do you see Lake Erie out there? You get blown into Lake Erie, make sure you pop your shit and roll out of the harness. Because the parachute comes down, it'll fill with water and pull you to the bottom of the lake and you'll drown. Have a nice day. I was literally scared to this. I could not generate spit, but my hands were so sweaty. Whatever I touched became instant water sparks everywhere. I did it once. I'll never do it again. So we have an altimeter. All right. Now the altimeter causes the TNT to explode. This sphere here is uranium, and there's a hole inside of it, sort of like a bowling ball. Okay, there's a big hole inside of it. When it explodes, that uranium gets slammed into this slab of metal. And there's two metals here. This metal contains lithium and polonium. When lithium and polonium get slammed together, we start releasing neutrons. Okay? 
Those neutrons then go into the uranium, cause a fission reaction, cause explosion. Does that make sense? Any questions? That's the first one, the little boy. It's a bullet bomb. We're firing it at a piece of polonium. Are we good there? Any questions? Okay, the second one is called the fat man. Now, the fat man was called that because it was huge, probably about the size of this room. Okay, in the center here, we have plutonium. Okay, and plutonium reacts when there's pressure put on something. So all the way around this, we have explosives. Okay, so what they did is they would have all the explosions detonate simultaneously at the same time pushing pressure on that plutonium, causing it to crack. And when it cracked, it released the gamma energy. Does that make sense? This is one of the hardest one to do because this is 1945. We don't have really good timers. So they, they had a lot of problems getting all of it to react at the same time. Second one. Third one they attempted to build was a thin man. Now the thin man was another, another what's called an implosion device. It's an I9E. Like the fat man, it was an implosion device for uranium. They could never get it to work. So it was multiple. So how many different types of devices do they have? Two. And we actually two working. So how many bombs did they actually have? Well, they actually had three. They had the fat man, they had the little boy, and they had a second fat man, which they called Destiny. Because that's the one they set off in Los Alamos, Mexico, to see it would work. So they only had three, they blew one up, they only have two bombs, that's it. All right? So, the date is August 6th and August 15th, 1945. Remember, who got the letter from uh, Einstein? FDR. And how many terms did FDR serve as president? Three. He's the only president of the United States ever to have three terms. He was elected in 1938, 42, and 40, 40 and 44, 36, 40 and 44. But before 1945, something happens. Roosevelt dies has a stroke in his office, and who's president of the United States now? Harry? Yes, Harry S. Truman. Now you notice I didn't put a dot there after S? Does anyone know what S stands for? S, S yes, literally it's just the letter, Harry S. Truman. His parents were unusual. Now, he just became president of the United States not more than about two or three months before this. How much information about the Manhattan Project does Harry S. Truman know about the Manhattan Project? Zero. He knows absolutely nothing. Why? Because the Manhattan Project was need to know, and Harry no need to know. So he becomes president of the United States. He's immediately written in. By August 1945, who are the three combatants against us? And was the Allies against the Axis powers, right? And who were the three nations and the Axis powers. Italy. Okay, we have Italy, we have Germany. Germany, and we have Japan. Japan. Now, who was the first one out? The Italians, yes. We're lovers, not fighters, okay? In fact, the Italians never wanted to be in the war in the first place. They weren't really happy with Mussolini, the, the leader at the time. When he first gave the power, the big thing is that he made the trains run on time. He got everything organized, but things really got bad. Whenever you move into total socialism, which, which basically the fascist system was a form of socialism, nothing really works right because there's no encouragement for productivity. And 
there wasn't enough food, there wasn't enough productivity. So the Italians got mad when they got their hands on Mussolini, they quartered him. Does anyone know what that means? Yeah, one grabbed an arm, one grabbed an arm, a leg, a leg, a head, and they yanked and they pulled and they ripped them apart. Go take off an Italian. All right, so Italy is out of the game. Germany, is Germany still in the fight? Not by 1945. You see, um, you remember we, we, we said that the entire reason we got this is because the Nazis were working the bomb. Does anyone know who the scientist in charge was? A man named Heisenberg. You guys remember Heisenberg? Heisenberg, the Cerny principle. He got the Nobel Prize in the United States, but he was a Nazi. He came into the United States as part of Operation Paperclip. We basically grabbed as many Nazi scientists as we could, promising we wouldn't kill them if they come to our country and do research. Von Braun, the head of NASA, was also the guy that ran the Nazis' white bomb program. So the only problem, the reason why Heisenberg couldn't get the nuclear bomb to work is in order to make that reaction process, you need heavy water. And they couldn't get enough heavy water. Does anyone know why they couldn't get heavy water? The United States, the Allies. Whenever they would get heavy water, we would sabotage. We'd blow the plant up. They couldn't get enough heavy water. The reaction didn't work. Hitler gave up on the program. So Germany is beginning to lose the war. In fact, in 19, early 1945, Adolf Hitler goes into his bunker, bunker in Germany as the Russians are coming on the Western Front and the English and Americans are coming on the Eastern Front. He goes in with his newly married bride, Ivan von Braun, and they go in and they have a lead sandwich as they both kill themselves in the bunker. Hitler's dead. Germany's out of the war. Only country left is Japan. Could we have waited maybe six months to a year to allow the Russians to come from Germany all the way across the Urals to the, and then have Japan on two front war? Yeah, we could have. But here's the problem. Estimates said that if we, Japan had implanted themselves island and island and island, there was estimates that if we try to take Japan out between 100 to 200,000 American servicemen, sailors, would be killed. You ever seen the, the, the Battle of Iwo Jima? You ever seen Flag of Our Fathers? I mean, the Japanese fought with incredible abandonment because the Japanese have a system of honor, okay? If they are going to lose, they will die before they lose. How strong is this? This sense of honor? In the 1970s, 1970s, how many years has it been since World War II at this point? In 20 and 30 years. There was a group of Japanese soldiers who were, were based in the Philippines. They had lost communication with mainland Japan. They were continuing to fight the war until the 1970s. They saw the planes going over the head, headed for Korea, headed for Vietnam. They assumed they were still in the war. They were shooting people in the 1970s, trying to win World War II. Finally, they brought an old elderly admiral out. He gave the command call down system and they finally surrendered. But they were not, they would not surrender. So literally it would have been incredibly grisly, horrible battle to fight. So in August 6th, 1945, a plane called the Enola Gay flew out with a little boy. Now, when it went, it was a top secret mission. Does anybody know what ship brought the little boy out to the, um, the Philippine areas to fly out and bomb the first one? It was called the Indianapolis. Have you ever heard of Indianapolis before? You guys ever seen the movie Jaws? Okay, movie Jaws, remember Shaw talks about being on the Indianapolis? That's a true story. And when they brought the, the bomb out, the, the, the mission was so top secret, when they were hit by U-boats and the ship sank, they didn't send a distress signal. Over 1,500 men went 
were on the ship. Only about seven to 800 made it into the water. Only 300 men got out of the water two weeks later and they were fine. The rest were eaten by sharks. So that's a true story of the Indianapolis. So, you know, okay, huge flying fortress drops the bomb on Hiroshima. Total devastation. How strong is a nuclear bomb? When I was your age, it was 1984, my junior year, we went to the UN in New York. It was the 40th anniversary coming up of the dropping of the bomb. And they had these huge rocks in the middle of the lobby. And in the rocks, you saw an impression of what looked like a man painted on the rock. Actually, that was a man. The, the glass was so strong that it imprinted his shadow onto the rock. And he had a watch in the rock. And you saw the exact time in the rock that the bomb went off, 11.15. Okay? That's how incredibly strong these things are. People, if the bomb went off right here, right now, you would see a bright light, and that would be it. Everything in this room would vaporize, sublimate, go from a solid to a gas, okay? Up to 50 miles away, you would be pulverized. The rocks and debris would crush you down to like World Trade Center kind of stuff. And then up to 75 miles an hour, you would asphyxiate because the gas would be so full of dust that you couldn't breathe. And then 100 miles away, you die of radiation poisoning. When Nagasaki, and I'll get to that one in a second, Nagasaki, we missed the target. So it was quite a ways away. The people there were burned. They were so hot, they were thirsty. It began to rain, so they began to drink the rain. The rain was radioactive. They got leukemia and almost all of them died. All right, so did the Japanese surrender after August 6th? Now, so August 15th, second ship called the Boxcar dropped it on Nagasaki. Now, were there larger targets we could have chosen? Yes. Were there more military targets we could have chosen? We could have dropped it on Tokyo. We would have destroyed millions of people. We chose relatively low assets to make the point. So we dropped it. It was a cloudy day in Nagasaki in August 15, 1945. They, they were not allowed to drop until they could see the city because they didn't want to miss. They missed the target by over half a mile and still leveled the whole city. Okay. Um, what happened after that? Japanese? They surrendered. Why? Why did they surrender? How many bombs do we have? Two. How many bombs do we drop? Two. The Japanese know that? They thought we had hundreds and we dropped these things all day long. So they gave up. The war's over, 1945. All right. Now, there is a positive use for nuclear power. Okay? Nuclear power has three main benefits. Okay? The first benefit is that it is a clean energy source. What do you mean clean? See this white stuff coming out the top? Is that smoke? What is that? That's just point water vapor. So environmentally, it doesn't impact our environment all that much. Second, it's efficient. Remember I talked about the nuclear attack sub? How big a rod ran every system? A nuclear attack sub for six months, about that long and about that wide. Incredibly efficient. And third, it's incredibly abundant. There is enough nuclear uranium to last us between three to 500 years. Okay, so it's an incredibly abundant source. Okay, is nuclear power the, yay! Everyone wants nuclear power? Okay, what's the main reason for that? Well, there's three main problems that have taken place. Okay, well, before I do that, I got ahead of myself. Here's a nuclear reactor works like. Don't try to draw this. I'll make it a lot easier for you. Okay, how does a nuclear power plant work? 
We start with uranium. Uranium-238. We don't use 235 because it's way too reactive. Okay. We initiate the reaction and it's kept in what is called H3O heavy water. Now, could this reaction get out of control? Yes. To keep it from getting out of control, we have rods that go in or get out in order to control the reaction. They're called control rods. In the United States, those control rods are composed of cadmium. What the cadmium does is it absorbs the neutrons and slows the reaction down. Okay? So this water is going to get hot, right? Because we're heating it up. We then pump the water out of the vessel. Again, this water is hot, right? And we pump it past a pool of cold water. When hot water passes cold water, what happens to the water? It becomes steam, right? The steam then turns a turbine, which is basically a magnet inside of coiled wires, produces electricity. Let's just do this one produces electricity, right? And the water gets pumped back in the vessel. Now to keep it from being dangerous, the entire vessel is encased in concrete. That's why that thing is so huge, because most of that is concrete to absorb the neutrons, to keep the radiation from exposing it. Does that make sense? All right, I think that's all I need. All right, now, Three events have shaped the world's opinion of nuclear power. The first is TMI, Pennsylvania. Does anyone know where Three Mile Island is located? It was on the Susquehanna. It's just a little bit south of Philadelphia. What happened here? Remember those hot water, cold water? Okay. The pipe got cracked. So the steam that released was radioactive. Okay. Now, one of the major concerns, I remember 1979, I'm about like 12 years old. There was a movie that came out called China Syndrome. Now, the China Syndrome was about a nuclear disaster. And it talked about a natural phenomenon called the China Syndrome. What happens in a China Syndrome? Here's our Earth, right? Nuclear power plant experiences what's called a meltdown. The reactor gets so hot, literally, the reactor melts down. It heats up the rock, makes the rock into lava and begin to flow down, okay? In theory, the reason why it's called China syndrome, in theory, if it melted down, it'd go all the way down through to the other side of the planet, China. That's why it's called China syndrome. But before it got there, you're gonna go through something. What are you gonna go through? The Earth's core, the mantle, okay? It would then be a vacuous hole for the mantle to come out. If the entire mantle came out of that hole, would there be an inner core of the Earth? What would happen to the entire planet at that point? It would implode. I was teaching this back about 20 years ago to a bunch of ninth graders. A little girl raised her hand and said, Mr. Fenner, did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I go, uh, no, we're still here. No, it never happened. And it, this would be an absolute worst case scenario. 
because long before it got there, hopefully the, the crevasse would collapse in on itself anyway. And have we ever gotten close to this though? Yes. April 28, 1986. I am now a freshman in college. Okay. Chernobyl, USSR. Okay. Who caused this? Ultimately, the USA. What? How the US, did we bomb the plant? No, 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 no. You see, President of the United States at the time the United States was a man named Ronald Reagan. And Reagan had a program called Star Wars. Now, Star Wars is not Luke Skywalker and Anakin and all that kind of stuff. Well, Luke Star Wars was, was a platform where we would fire rockets to take out ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. In early 1986, we ran a test. We fired a rocket, we sent an a, a, a ICBM up without a nuclear warhead, of course, in it, and the rocket came and blew it out of the sky. Everyone's excited, happy, hey, we don't have to worry about nuclear bombs anymore. Was everybody excited about that? No, the Russians were scared spitless. Why? Because now their rockets are ineffective and we have them, and we can take them out, right? So they're trying like crazy to make this program work. And they're pumping billions and billions of dollars and they can never get it to work. Do you know why they couldn't get it to work? Bonnie lied. That, that ICBM had a tracking beacon on it. The second rocket couldn't miss. So we knew that we were lying, but we wanted to scare the Russians in order to cause them to pump lots of their money. Now, part of the problem is they were pulling money out of domestic programs, like their nuclear program. And in the Russia, remember the control rods? The ones we talked about were made out of what in the United States? Canyon. They couldn't afford it. Too expensive. So they were using graphite. What's graphite made out of? Yeah, carbon. It's carbon. It does work, but you need to be very careful with it because does carbon burn? Yeah, carbon. Remember combustion reaction? Carbon does burn. So in order to try to, to save money, in Chernobyl, they were running the reactor at 120 percent. What's the percent sign? 120 percent efficiency. What does that mean? Here's safe. Here's what they were running. Okay. The reactor began to scramble. It began to melt down. Literally, the Russian scientists in charge got freaked out and hit a button called the panic button. Literally, it's called a panic button. The red button. All those graphite rods slammed in real quick to slow the reaction down. Now, in the United States, if we had done this, we'd be totally fine. Cadmium absorbs the neutron, reaction stops, we're good to go. Graphite, not so much. Okay, graphite rods, they detonate. Okay, they explode. It got so hot inside that reactor that the water literally caught fire. It caused the water to separate into hydrogen and oxygen and was bursting the hydrogen into flames. Okay, the reactor is now melting down. Is this bad? China syndrome. Yes. So, how do they stop it? A bunch of very brave Russian firefighters using boring tools like mining equipment dug underneath the reactor filled it with super, super coolants and caused the reactor to slow down. Did it ever cool down? No. Even today, that's what? 30 years, 40 years later almost? It's still hot. Okay? What they did is, if you were to go to Chernobyl, first of all, there's no one lives in Chernobyl anymore. All the wildlife was killed. They had to dig all the soil up because it was all radioactive. You would see a huge dome. Where the, where the reactors were, and they just 
encase the thing in concrete. And every so many years they go out with you know, the iron counters and they reseal to make sure, it, and that's all they can do. Because it's literally gonna be hot. The half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years. Remember, half-life is the amount of time for half of it to decompose. So is that thing gonna be hot forever? Yes. All right. Is that the last one though? Oh, we had hold so hoped for, but unfortunately it was not. March 11th, 2011, only 10 years ago now. Fukushima, Daiki, Japan. We weren't involved in this one, I can promise you, okay? How did this reaction, nuclear disaster take place? A tsunami, yes. What happened was a tsunami, a tidal wave, came in. Okay. Actually, it started with an earthquake. Yes. Why didn't we just put like our cadmium rods down and drop the one in CA? It wasn't. It wasn't a meltdown. There. It was. Uh, I mean, it was a leak. It was. It was cracked pipe. Uh, so it was a reactor. There was no meltdown in Pennsylvania, but it was scary because they were releasing radioactive material. Yes, ma'am. Have you seen the movie Impossible? On what? Impossible. No, I haven't. Okay, all right. Well, what happened here? We had an earthquake. And the earthquake shook the reactor. So the reactor began to melt down. Now, did they had do they have cadmium in Japan? Oh yeah, Japan had lots of money. So they had cadmium in there. They were in the process of effectively shutting the reactor down to keep it from melting down when the tidal wave came in. The tidal wave flooded in, flooded the, the, the batteries, the, the generators, and shorted them out. So literally there was no way to, to stop the reaction. And the only way to keep the reactor from melting down is the Japanese began to pump in seawater. The problem when they pump it in, they're also going to have to pump it out. Literally, they just pumped it right out into the ocean. So you, could, if you took a, an x-ray of planet Earth, you could literally see radiation just flowing right out of Japan. I probably would not eat anything from the Pacific for a few, like, hundred years, possibly, just because of the fact that you don't know what they've been exposed to. Okay, third disaster. Now, is that horrible? Yes. But if you consider how many coal plants there are, were there more coal disasters in that same amount of time? So is three a whole lot? No, the only thing is because when they are, they're huge and possible life ending the planet, right? So question I have for you, what is the number one problem with nuclear energy? And no, it is not a nuclear disaster. Does anyone know what the number one problem is? What? Well, that's possible, but there's another problem that's actual real that has to do with people's minds. It's called nuclear waste, okay? Whenever we produce uranium-238, are we gonna have reactive waste? Yes. How long does nuclear waste have to sit around? 4.5 billion years, right? So basically, Forever. Is there a way of dealing with it? Yes. The process is called, oops, I gotta put a slide in here. Okay, add a slide. Process is called containment. Right? Now this is not just nuclear waste. This is also x-ray materials. This is like chemotherapy. All that stuff generates nuclear waste, right? So what we do is we take a thick slab of concrete. Okay? Probably about 20 feet in depth. We put the radioactorials in barrels. Yes, ma'am? Okay? 
Okay? Put them in barrels. We then encase the whole thing in more concrete. And then we bury it in the ground. For how long? Forever. Now, what we were doing in the 1950s and 1960s, we were sending this Nevada NE or NA? NV, that's right, Nevada. We were sending it shipping in Nevada. Was Nevada happy about this? No! We don't want your waste. So they petitioned Congress, and Congress made a law. Every three states had to form a consortium. So the states of Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania formed a consortium. Now, for this process, we need three things. We want access to interstate. So we can ship it to by vehicles, right? We want access to railroads so we can bring it by train. And third, we want a rural area. Okay? All right. Randolph Township. Where is I-80 close by? I-79? I-90? Are there railroad tracks all over Crawford County? And do you get any more rural than Randolph Township? So one of the prime sites was Randolph Township in the 1980s. Yay, we get to win. Hold on. Do we have a nuclear waste site here? No. Why? The principle of NIMBY. What does NIMBY stand for? Not in my backyard. Okay? So there's a huge amount of fight. Why is there a fight? Okay. Ms. Lasky, let's say you're a dairy farm. Okay? You got a lot of land. I'm going to pay you about say a million dollars an acre. Are you happy? Okay. So I'm going to take, you're going to give about four to five billion dollars. You're going to go live in Tahiti someplace. You're going to retire. Ms. Moorhead is her neighbor. Who else has a dairy farm? I don't need your land. Are you happy with your, why not? Yeah, so you should have it for your friends. What about your dairy farm? Is your dairy farm safe? Well, I can bring about research that shows that there'll be no leakage. You'll be totally fine. You're still not happy. Gabby, you run a dairy processing plant. Are you going to take your milk? Right next to the nuclear waste site. Probably not. But I can prove to you it's safe. You're not going to trust that, are you? No, probably not. So what happened? What would happen to the property value in Randolph Township? Hit the toilet. We didn't have it here. Where did it move to? Lancaster County. Yes, the Amish got it. Yay! That's we didn't know they're getting. I guess. All right. So that's the principle. That's vision. That's first half. Now we go. I told you this was going to be long. Yes, ma'am. So is that like the only nuclear waste site in Pennsylvania? Yep. Okay with that. Somebody had to have it. Somebody had to have it. So, yeah, it, it is. Had to go someplace. So they found the most rural place possible. They bought up all the land around it to try to keep property value. And if you've been to Lancaster, it's got enough growth that it's it's doing okay. All right, so don't feel too bad for the others. Yeah. All right, now the second process we're gonna look at. You guys need to take a break now, or are we okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you five minutes. How's that? Does that sound fair? Yes, you may. I'm recording. All right. So second process is nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is energy from the combining of atoms. Nuclear fusion is from the combining of atoms. Way that I always keep this straight in my mind. Which was first, fission or fusion? Fission. Alphabetically, which comes first, F I or F U? F I. So that's how I keep it straight. Vision was first. Fusion, we haven't quite gotten there yet. All right. So it's energy from the combining of atoms. Now the process itself for nuclear fusion. It's first of all, identifies differences and the similarities. 
Okay, vision. Why is that going slow? Is splitting. Fusion. Combining. Fission is um, occurring. Fusion is still theoretical. Okay. Similarities. Okay, they both deal with energy. They both deal with atoms. They both deal with particles. So those be the similarities and differences between fission and fusion. Okay. Do you have any few more seconds? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, we'll talk on, as far as on the Earth's sake. That's what we're talking about. On the Earth's sake. Yeah, you're right. Fusion technically has occurred before, but not on the Earth. Not safe. Okay? Are we good here? No, nope. any more time? Okay, we good? All right, now, the reaction itself. For fission, we take tritium, T-R-I-T-I-U-M, which is H3. It's an isotope of hydrogen. And we add it to deuterium, D-E-U-T-E-R-I-U-M, deuterium, H2. Okay, we take tritium, T-R-I-T-I-U-M, and add it to deuterium, D-E-U-T-E-R-I-U-M, H3 with H2, you put down H3 and H2, okay? And we get helium, H-E, or over two, and a neutral, okay? Okay, so H3, tritium, with H2, deuterium, generates helium, He, four over two, plus a neutron. That's the reaction itself. Pretty simple, right? Any questions? Are we good? All right, now, the only place, yes, sir? It doesn't produce a chain reaction. It's, it's continual, it's just hydrogen to helium. Basically, the easiest way to say hydrogen to helium. Now, the only place, as Alex alluded to before, that a nuclear fusion reaction works efficiently is a star. Because there's enough gravitational force to hold the reaction in check, right? Life cycle of a star. What color does a star start out at? Does anyone know? What it just born? White. Goes from white to a little bit older, it gets blue. Oh, sad, it's blue. Then it turns from blue to yellow, which is important to us. Why? That's our sun. Our sun is a yellow star. It's a, mid, it's a midlife. It's going through the midlife crisis right now. Okay? From yellow, it turns orange. Any idea the last color? Red. Okay, now, when it's white, it's incredibly small. Maybe about the size of a city. Okay? It's really, really small. Lots of energy can pack. As it gets blue, size of a planet. Okay? It's expanding out because it's running out of hydrogen. Then it goes yellow, the size of our star. Orange is even more massive. And red, it's a giant. Now, at that point, three things can happen. First of all, at red, it can either burn out. Okay? If it burns out, we call that a neutron star. It, it's just it's it's just gravitational it's there but no energy so it's not blowing at all it's just but it still has all the planets around it okay because it still has a gravitational field make sense mm -hmm. third class yes sir 
Well, first of all, the planet temperature would be about negative 250 degrees Celsius. So life on the planet would probably cease to exist at that point. Yeah. So, and that's not going to happen for like four to five billion years, maybe. Well, I mean, it, the closest one is about seven to eight light years away. I think if, if we could get there. If we could get there, yes. Oh. If we could get there, yes. Although the gravity would be so strong that when you landed, you'd be about three inches tall. Right? It could press you down to nothing. Is that kind of cute? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's almost like a different planet and get a question. For some reason. No. Three inches, yeah. Like All right, dollars. second possibility. It would generate what's called a pulsar. Does anyone know what a pulsar is? Yeah, part of it's part of it's on fire, part of it's not. So as it spins, because you know plant stars do spin, they're literally like a lighthouse. Okay, that's why it's called a pulsar. Okay, the third is called a supernova. Anybody know what a supernova is? Okay, red giant, huge, right? When it's run out, it does a massive reversal. It collapses all the way back down to a white dwarf again, and then it detonates. And every planet in the solar system is pulverized. Would that be bad for us? Well, actually, all of these would be really bad for us, okay? Because life on this planet would cease to exist for any of those situations. Even the pulsar, we're not going to get anywhere enough energy. How do we know this? Because we've seen it in other stars. We could like see this all going down. Yep, yep. But and say, one of the people believe that the star of Bethlehem might have been a pulsar. I mean, a uh, supernova. Oh, Blew up, yeah. But that would have been about like trillions and trillions light years away because if it was anywhere near us, we'd be dead. Mm -hmm. Questions? All right, no. That's the only place it does work efficiently. We can make it unofficially in a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear device. Do you remember I went through and explained the process of how we make an atomic bomb, a, a, a uranium bomb, a fission bomb? This is what I can show you about a hydrogen bomb. Nada. The government does not allow plans of a hydrogen bomb to be released. Why? Can I get uranium-238? Or 235, or plutonium from the local department store? Yeah. Can I get hydrogen? So there's a, there's a chance that somebody, they knew the plans, could try. The only thing I can tell you, and this is the reason why you couldn't get it anyway, to set off an H bomb, we detonate a atomic bomb. Well, that is sort of hard to come by. But we detonate an atomic bomb to cause a Ford to make a hydrogen bomb. So it's like millions of times more powerful than an atomic bomb. Okay? When we set off the H bombs, we would level island. We set one H bomb and the island is gone until we destroyed it. Does that make sense? Now, what color countries have hydrogen bombs? Well, the United States, Russia, United Kingdom, and China. Those were the powers during World War II. So we got it first. And then the Rosenbergs, they sort of sold the secrets and they sort of paid for that with their life. Espionage, we killed them. Okay. The Russians got it. The whole nuclear standoff thing took off from there. Why did they sell it to them? Why didn't we sell it to no, them? No, no, no. Why did like the money? Because they were, they were communists. Oh, so they were like being sneaky? Yeah, they believed in the, the communist system and they wanted them to have. Well, here's what it is. Okay, finish up the rest of the answer. Okay. What countries have gotten it since then? France, oh. India, Pakistan, and that's sort of dangerous. India and Pakistan, have you ever heard of Kashmir? It's a region between these two countries and they both have nuclear weapons. Could be bad. Israel? The only reason why Israel exists as a nation is because they have nukes and all their neighbors know they have nukes. That's it, I'm serious. If, and North Korea, we do believe North Korea has it. The only thing is they can't generate an efficient ICBM to deliver it. Although they've sent some rockets over Japan 
trying to prove that they close. And that's why we always get nervous whenever North Korea starts around. There's one country that's really, really close and we're not sure about yet. And that's Iran. Is Iran the nuclear bomb a bad thing? Oh, yes. They are the Shiite Muslims. They're the ones who want to, like, from the river to the sea, so shall Palestine ever be. Sounds like a nice rhyme. Does anyone know what that means? Israel is between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. So what they're saying is they want to take Israel off the map. Okay? That is Israel's state, I mean, Iran's state of goal. The annihilation of Israel. And if they get the nuclear bomb, whenever they get close, I'll be honest with you, what does Israel do? Mossad, they are a very efficient force. They take them out. Okay, I, I just heard of a, a cyber attack of a nuclear plant that messed things up. Where do you think that came from? Israel. They need to do that to survive. Only nation in the world where everyone around them hates them and wants them dead. Question. All right, now, there are two, where is, the, where is the only working nuclear fusion reactor plant? The only nuclear fusion reactor plant in the world. Nope, 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 all the way back. We already talked about it. The sun. The only one that works is the sun. Now there are two theories about how we might make it work. The first is called magnetic fields. And this actually is processing the work, but not well. And the second is lasers. The two ways we think we could get nuclear fusion to work is either magnetic fields or fusion. I mean lasers, okay? Ready, the first one. Okay, there's actually a plant called the Tomakak, Takamak reactor in the old Soviet Union, now Russia. What they do here, they have a magnetic field. And that magnetic field contains the hydrogen to helium reaction. Now the problem with it is it takes more energy to run than you can get out of it. So could you make a nuclear power plant out of this? No. This is for a theoretical study, basically. Okay? All right. The second is a laser. Now, does anyone know what a laser, laser itself is? What kind of word is laser? It's an acronym, like SCUBA, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, radar, radar, radio detection and ranging, sonar, sound, navigation and ranging. The letters mean something, all right? Laser stands for light amplified by Simultaneous emissions of radiation. Light amplified by simultaneous emissions of radiation. I get why they made an acronym. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's I, I read about this in a popular science magazine. Science teacher, go figure. Okay. It was called Star in a Bottle. What they do is they take heavy water and they fire four lasers all around it. Yes, ma'am. Remember H3O? Remember the heavy water that for the nuclear reactor? Same thing. So it's just more more hydrogen. More hydrogen. Okay, heavy water. They pile them all together and they compress hydrogen and atom together and they generate a microstar. They can then put solar cells around it, get nuclear solar energy. Sound cool? Now, here's the problem. The way a laser works, okay, I have light firing out. You know light? When we talked about it, light is both a particle and a wave, right? 
you want the light to bounce back and forth between two mirrors. As it bounces back and forth, constructive interference, it gets stronger, right? But we need that light to remain in phase. So we put a crystal inside of it. That crystal keeps the, the light wave in phase. When it gets strong enough, zap, it fires out. How strong? Okay, do you guys ever see those, the scanners? You know, beep, beep. Do you see the little warning label? What does the warning label say? Do not look directly at the laser. Why? What will happen if you look at the red laser directly? Be blindness. Mr. Fenner, I looked at the laser and I'm not blind. Actually, yes, you are. You see what happens is it's called pinpoint blindness. It makes a small sear on your retina. But our brains are so incredible that we're able to overcome that. And our brain is able to go, okay, I don't see that spot, but I think this is what should be here. And we fix it for ourselves. Because it's so small, it's almost unnoticeable. You guys know Mrs. Statman? Mrs. Statman, she taught chemistry over at Sacred Town. She was my student teacher way back in the day. She now is in charge of the PCA. Her husband, David Salmon, is a professor at Allegheny. He has lasers that if you went back across your eye, you don't have to worry about getting your retina scan to see if you're blind. It would blow the retina out the back of your eye. You would know you're blind, okay? It's that strong. Why does he have those? What's that? Why does he have those? Um, he makes holograms with them, like a three-dimensional image, and they need that power laser to make the image more effective. Now, would this pressure of nuclear fusion cause a back pressure on the laser? Yeah, because if you're pushing down, it's going to push back, right? That pushback cracks the laser, crack, cracks the crystal. And since these crystals are about 50, 60,000 dollars a piece, it's not efficient yet. If we get crystals strong enough to resist, we'd have an abundant energy source. Does this make sense? And with that, you're done. All good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Was it that bad? You know, um,